Good morning and welcome to the CABE webinar for Wednesday the 12th of August. Today we are looking at active buildings in practice with Joanna Clark. As you'll know by now, my name is Jordan and I'm the Regional Services Administrator here at CABE. I will be your moderator for this morning's session. We do like to make them interactive, so please do send through any comments, feedback or questions. Um, we can go through these at the end with Joanna. If we get a lot, then I will email them over to her and we will send out the answers um, once I have them. So, as I mentioned, your presenter this morning is Joanna Clark. Joanna is a registered architect currently employed as a design manager at Specific Innovation and Knowledge Centre, Swansea University. Here she uses her 13 years experience as a project architect in commercial practice to support the design and delivery of active building projects. In her role to assist the team in driving forward new technologies from research through to commercialisation, she designed and project managed two building demonstrator projects, the active classroom and the active office. These buildings demonstrate the active building concept developed at Specific using both novel and commercially available technologies and were delivered collaboratively with construction partners. Her role includes leading national and international activities on the architectural design of novel and next generation demonstrator buildings, which capture, store and release energy. In addition, she is developing an active building design guide as part of a professional doctorate in sustainable built environment, which she commenced in April 2017. Delivering CPD workshops for architects, delivering training material and active buildings for installers and architectural students, and supporting active building projects with industrial partners. This includes designing an active classroom for rural villages in India, supporting the Sunrise at project at Swansea University. So if you give me just a couple of seconds, I'll hand over to Joanna and she can take you through this morning's session. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Jordan. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, so, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today and for taking the time to attend. Um, as Jordan said, um, today I'm going to discuss work that I'm currently undertaking to develop a design guide for a type of low energy buildings known as active buildings through both my role at Specific um, and as part of my doctoral research project. Um, I really need to do this slide now as Jordan covered most of this, um, but this just gives you a brief background to my work. Um, as you can see on this map, I'm located in Swansea in South Wales. Um, as Jordan's already said, I started um, my career working as an architect in practice, joined Specific Innovation and Knowledge Centre in 2013. Um, Specific is a centre focused on developing functional coatings for buildings, primarily around solar energy um, and also looking at both electrical and thermal energy storage. Um, my role at Specific when I joined was to liaise with the construction industry to enable them to adopt new technologies for buildings. Um, and to aid this, I designed first of all a small off-grid building, um, which we built in 2014. This is known as the active pod um, and it generates its own heat and electricity, um, incorporated energy storage and also a novel resistive heating system developed at Specific. We then moved on to bigger demonstrators, the active classroom and the active office. And during this time, I started my professional doctorate in the sustainable built environment, which I aim to complete um, next year, all being well. <laughs> So um, the definition of an active building is one that supports the energy network by intelligently integrating renewable energy technologies for heat, power and transport. There are six core principles for active buildings. Um, the first two are concerned with reducing the energy consumption in buildings through building fabric, passive design and use of energy efficient systems that all work together. Um, second two then focus on optimising the, the energy consumption 
by including uh, on-site renewable energy generating technologies and energy storage. And the last two then focus on the integration of buildings with the wider energy network and with each other. Um, and this includes the use of EV charging, electric vehicle charging, to help balance the supply and demand. I'll talk about that a little bit um, further when I go into the case studies. So, um, yeah, as we mentioned, the first real sort of building uh, demonstrator that we constructed was the active classroom in 2016. Um, this was a quite, it was very experimental building. So it included some pre-commercial technologies, which we then combined with more established technologies. For example, if you can see in the bottom left of the slide here, you can just make out um, the black cladding, which has tiny perforations in it. Um, that's a transpired solar collector, which generates um, warm air, which we then supply to an air source heat pump and MVHR unit. Um, the next picture shows um, the PV roof installation, which was the first roof installation of, from a Welsh company called BIPV Co, who bond thin film photovoltaics. So it's basically the next generation of PV um, on moving on from silicon onto steel roof sheets. Um, they do that in a factory um, near Newport, and then the roof, when it comes to site, is already capable of generating, so it just needs to be connected up once it comes to site. Um, and when we installed this, it uh, was pre-MCS accreditation for the system, um, so it was very new to market. We also used um, a new form of construction, um, a company that was new to the construction industry, and that was um, an off-site panel construction. Um, and you can see the, clad the lines and the cladding um, correspond with the panels that we used. Um, so we were trying to, at the time, demonstrate how you could um, design for deconstruction. So in effect, you could just put these panels together to make the building. And then um, the idea is you can take them down at the end of use of the project and reuse them on other projects, on other buildings. Um, the building sits on steel screw pile foundations, which again, um, at the end of the building's life can be taken out from the ground and reused on other projects. Um, we also then used a novel form of electric st electrical storage, which is these large batteries that you can see in the center picture. And they're basically salt water batteries. So they're the only energy storage um, system that's actually got cradle to cradle certification. There's um, everything in there is recyclable um, and the electrolyte they use is basically salt, like salt water. So each of those batteries stores 30 kilowatt hours of electricity. So we have 60 in total, which is enough to run the building for a couple of days. Now, we did notice because this was the new technology, after a couple of years of being in the building, we noticed um, some degradation of the batteries. So earlier this year, we replaced them with another battery technology called flow batteries. Um, again, these have um, pretty good environmental credentials when compared against other battery systems. And the batteries you can see in that picture now actually store double the amount of energy as the um, first batteries that we installed. So this building enables us to test different um, technologies. The, this, the picture next to the batteries, this one here, shows um, a new PV window that was um, developed by NSG. Um, and we retrofitted that into the building about a year um, after the building was constructed. Um, and we also trialed in this building and the new form of electric underfloor heating that was developed and manufactured at Specific. So in 2017, we were awarded funding from Innovate UK, who were one of our main funders. Um, they awarded us some money to construct a second building next to the active classroom. This building is two stories, which um, makes some of the aspects of um, trying to be energy positive a little more challenging. Um, and this one, um, they wanted us to demonstrate that it could be repeatable because the classroom was so experimental, you couldn't really repeat that. This one, they wanted to be to use more commercially available technologies and to be something that could be repeated. So we worked with a modular build company called Wernick, who are based um, not that far from the university. Um, and they basically, this is a modular building consisting of 12 modules. 
where we then sort of integrated these technologies onto. So we've got um, that same PV that we used on the classroom is now on a curved profile, which demonstrates its, its flexibility. The newest technology on this building, um, you can see here on the south elevation, um, is a combined solar thermal and PV system developed by a company called um, Naked Energy, who are also a UK company. Um, this was quite beneficial for them because they'd not installed a system of this size before and they'd only ever installed it on a flat roof. So they gained quite a lot of market traction from this project, which is an, one of the main aims of Specific is to help new companies um, get their products to market. So this was quite successful and they've since um, secured additional funding to develop their product further. Um, so that's quite nice. And we've also on this project got um, thermal storage as well as electrical storage. So you can see here that's in the form of a large water tank at the moment. Um, but one of the technologies we're developing that's specific is a form of interseasonal storage, which uses a thermochemical um, system. So we're hoping to retrofit that into the building at some point, probably next year now. Um, one of the key things about our buildings is um, the collecting data. So we collect a lot of data from the buildings um, and use that to improve on systems and building performance. Um, so the screen that you can see here, um, this is an image of the screen that we have in the entrance foyer, which visualizes the data we're collecting to building occupants and visitors. So I think having displays like this really helps to engage people with their energy consumption um, and they can try to start matching consumption perhaps to generation which is one of the things we're interested in doing. Um, so we are trying to get to the point where we have no uncontrolled import or export of energy and we're doing this um, controlling the import and export in relation to energy prices or carbon intensity of the grid at any time. Um, and you can just about make out on this graph here, you can see we're downloading the carbon intensity of the grid. So this is a real time image and we can compare our consumption and generation in, in relation to that. Um, to do this, energy storage and smart controls are needed. And the plan is as well to integrate the electric vehicle charging into this as well. So we've got a few projects with partners looking at demand side response and um, different sorts of ways of um, trade in energy. Um, so you can see here as well different ways we can visualize the data. So we can look at the environmental conditions in all the rooms at any time and we have lots of heat meters um, in the system which we use, they're very useful for fast fault detection um, and remediation. So as an example um, this year we were able to make a three megawatt hour saving in our energy compared to the first year of operation and most of this was um, down to identifying faults in the heating and ventilation systems and being able to pinpoint exactly where the faults were so this is aided by the extensive data mo monitoring which i think is important to um, any building going forward um, historically we've not really learnt from our buildings and i think that's something that definitely needs to change if we're moving to a low carbon um, society. So um, some of the contributing factors that we um, experienced with the heating and ventilation systems were, um, it was a combination of things, so, so partly it was the M&E design, there were commissioning errors, there was equipment failures, um, a lack of rigour in checking the equipment supplied against specifications, and this is quite a key one. So the heating system, we, it was as designed, would have been able to deliver 10 kilowatts of heating from a 45 degree heat source. But this was missed by the installers of the air handling units. And the air handling units were sized to be able to provide that level of heating from an 80 degree heat source. And that did cause you know, significant um, issues with our energy usage. But because we had these heat meters and this extensive um, data monitoring, we were able to pinpoint that and rectify it quite quickly. And the use of different subcontractors, um, that's quite key. So we had um, separate subcontractors installing the PV roof to the ones installing the batteries to the electrical contractors. And that caused issues um, and also with the BMS installers because 
when there were issues or when you were trying to um, design this system holistically, you did, you know, it was quite difficult to get everyone to be on site at the same time and it was difficult to pinpoint where any issues lay, you know, who was responsible for them. So um, I'll just move on to talk a little bit now about the work that I'm doing to try and enable the construction industry to adopt this concept in buildings. And the demonstrators are a really good part of that. They're the sort of starting point. Um, but for me, to start the process, I first examined the current state of the construction industry. Um, to it, and that was just to help identify areas of focus. Um, and I started this through using my own knowledge and experience of the industry. Um, and I adapted this diagram, which has which was developed originally to um, help develop strategies for organizations. But I thought, well, I can apply that to the, uh, the construction industry. Um, I won't go into all of these in detail, because um, I think you'll be able to get the slides later, but it just gives you the idea of the sorts of issues that we're looking at. And we need to start with what we already know about the industry before we can decide where we want the industry to go and how we might get there. So my vision then for a future construction industry is that, you know, buildings are des do perform as designed. Um, we need to attract new talent. We all are aware of the sort of skills shortage in the construction industry and the fact that it's not really seen as an attractive career to many. Um, and the fact that really our main driver should be net zero now, that's, that's what everybody should be working towards. Um, so I then undertook some workshops with architects and other designers to identify the main challenges that they see um, in preventing the introduction of innovative technologies or strategies into the industry. These were the main sorts of words that were coming up during the sessions, um, and I've grouped the main challenges under the headings that are in larger text. So um, the ones that I'm going to be tackling in my project are these ones that are circled in red. So um, there's often a lack of knowledge about new technologies and sort of getting to the um, to understand what sort of information is out there and how realistic information is. And designers tend to you know, suffer from a lack of time. They're under severe time constraints on projects and they don't have the time to go out and look at um, new technologies and to fully understand um, how effective they are. There's fears over risk of using new technologies, so our demonstrators try to help de-risk some of these um, technologies and products before um, anybody else can adopt them. So if we can gather data on their effectiveness, that should hopefully give people um, some um, feeling that the, the technologies do work well. Um, people often fear you know, um, that there's going to be more maintenance involved with these technologies. There's this lack of feedback, so we don't capture the learning um, from projects. So these are all the sorts of things that I'm hoping to tackle in my projects. So I then looked at mechanisms that have been used in the industry to introduce other new schemes or initiatives, such as BIM. Um, and as you can see, I grouped these into four main strands and found that these are common to the introduction of um, most things actually into the industry, such as um, BRIAM, uh, any changes to building regulations, such as the adoption of sprinklers in new homes in Wales, and the launch of new design guidance. So for everything that you try and do, you've really got to consider all of these things, I think, if you're trying to um, enable people to adopt something new. So I look back then at what Specific had done so far to aid the introduction of the new concept. Um, and I also identified other work needed to assist this. So these boxes that are highlighted in red um, show the, 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 sorry, the documents and tools that I'm developing myself in this project. And they will form uh, what I'm calling an active building toolkit. So this, um, these will provide uh, information for people um, embarking on active building projects and show the sorts of um, examples of technologies, for example, that they can use um, and case studies of projects that you've seen today and other projects that we're involved with. Um, part of uh, developing these documents or tools is to test them with those who will be using them. So I have um, carried out some workshops with architects earlier in this year um, to gain feedback on the documents and whether or not people um, find them useful. 
um, but it would be good to get any views today um, if people can use the chat box or um, in the, the question and answer session at the end to um, ask any questions about what I'm doing. So although I don't have time to run through um, all the documents today, I'm just going to show you some extracts from some of the documents. So on this page, we can see some of the um, pages that are in the main design guide. Um, and it's it's quite tricky getting the balance between giving enough information and not giving too much information, and also how to lay that information out. So I know diagrams are very popular with designers because we like to um, look at diagrams rather than read lots and lots of text. So I've tried to keep it very much to sort of bullet points and a mixture of diagrams and small amounts of text where I can. Um, but I am keen to gain feedback on this. So anything you see that you don't think is useful or you don't like the look of, then please say. Um, this is some of the pages from the technology showcase. So the idea with this document is that I will just give some examples of um, possible technologies that could be included in an active building project and also show some of the emerging technologies. So, um, for example, in terms of electricity generation, I'll talk about the next generation of photovoltaic technology that um, some of our researchers that specific are working on, which is actually printed PV. So they are quite world leading in um, printed, printed photovoltaics, um, and they're looking at a particular technology called perovskite, which were invented a few years ago at Oxford University. But what our team are very good at doing is working on the scale up of that technology. So whereas um, a lot of university projects look at um, technology, their research is at a very small scale, we have facilities and we have skills to look at how to scale them up. So you can just about make out a small picture here in the middle of the screen, which is showing a small um, roll to roll line, which is printing photovoltaics onto, um, here it's a plastic substrate, but they can print them onto glass or steel. Um, and that's quite exciting because we can look at um, testing those new technologies as they're developed on our buildings. And I think it's always good for people to know what sort of technologies might be coming up in the future. So you can at least maybe um, factor that into designs. Um, one of the documents is um, some plan of work checklist. So what I've done is gone through the RIBA plan of work and made some checklists as to what you would need to think about if you were designing an active building at each of those individual stages. So um, I'll show you in, in on, on a later slide how this will translate into um, potentially a flow diagrams, which will take people through an active building project in a step-by-step -step, um, way. And here are just some pages from some of the other documents. So we've got a code of conduct, which um, outlines what we expect from an active building project um, and what the benefits are to clients and to designers. Um, I've got a document called a glossary, which includes um, lots of the key terminology that we use and also things like um, relevant training bodies and a section on frequently asked questions. So we're often asked, you know, about carbon and costs and procurement and all sorts of other things. And those will be um, brought into one document as well, which I think is always useful for people. So um, the final part of my project is to develop an interactive process flow diagram uh, using a method known as IDEF0. Um, and this was developed to model decisions, actions, and activities of an organization or a system. So I've looked at using this for an active building project. Um, so placing um, active building project at the heart of the diagram as the function, and then adding the inputs and outputs that we, um, the inputs that we have, which are the um, part of the toolkit and lessons learned and some of the challenges that we've experienced, the outputs, which would be a completed active building project and data that we can then feed back into the process. Um, and then the sorts of controls and mechanisms that feed into any project. So things like the plan of work and the principles of an active building and the climate change targets. Um, so I'll just um, 
the, the idea is, sorry, if I go back, if you click on each of these boxes, it will take you to wherever you want to go. So if you click on the first box, it will take you to this slide, which then sets out the steps that you would need to take in RIBA stage zero and so forth as the project progresses through the RIBA stages. So there are then perhaps further um, steps um, that, that are identified at each of these. So for example, here you can see under site anal analysis, you've then got another flow diagram for that, all the sorts of things that you should look at. Um, I'll just click through these just to give you the idea. Um, the tool isn't fully developed yet, but um, again, it would be good to get your feedback as to whether um, you think this might be a useful addition to the um, other documents to aid the design guide. Um, you can see here, sometimes you'll get this feedback loop. So while you're designing the building, by the time you get to um, look at the, the size, the energy generation storage, that might influence the design. So you'd have to go back over things. So it's about that iterative process and feeding back through. Um, some of these get um, a little more complicated as they go through and then you've got some simple ones as well. So I'm just quickly running through them rather than um, spending too much time on each one. But you can see the idea here is that when you look at your project in use, once you've uploaded your data to some kind of database, um, that data can then be used to feed back in to take you back to the first step to feed back into the process of designing your next active building project. Um, so this slide then just summarizes my project and shows the main purpose, which is to um, use the toolkit to design active building projects. So it basically summarizes we're using the data and experience of the active building demonstrators with my own architectural experience to develop this protocol. And then I'm focusing on the toolkit, which will provide these documents that will then be sort of underpinned by this um, process flow diagram and that can be used then to um, deliver lots of active building projects. Um, so that leaves me just to um, thank you all for listening. Um, I have rattled through quite a lot of that so if anybody wants to go back over anything um, please say. Um, we've now got a question and answer session, so there's an opportunity for anybody to ask questions, which I think um, Jordan will uh, maybe facilitate. I'm just trying to look in the box now to see if there are any questions. Um, Jordan, can you see any questions or any comments in the chat boxes? Yeah, of course. Um, okay, let me just make the box a little bit bigger. So, We've got a gentleman asking if he can have a link to the absorbing cladding panels. Um, ah, yes, of course. Um, yeah, they're a product that are made by um, Tata Steel. So they are, those panels are commercially available. Um, it's actually a product called Color Coat Renew SC, which is very t um, a very catchy name. <laughs> but I can certainly send the link through. Um, I wonder, can I, can I answer it on here? I'm wondering. Well, I'll, I'll send that through later when we send more information. Um, but yes, that's that's something we can definitely send a link to. Okay, brilliant. Um, so then we've got, have you carried out AB to a refurbishment of a structure? If so, what level of efficiency did you achieve if a new build is 100? Hmm. That's a good question. So um, we haven't done a lot of re uh, retrofit yet. We've mainly focused on new buildings, but we do have um, an example of a retrofit to an industrial building. Um, it's basically a large um, steel warehouse um, that we've so that that one we've um, installed the transpired solar collector, and we've also installed some heat storage technologies there. So. We're currently investigating that, but it's not um, 
a sort of full retrofit. We've not done any domestic retrofits. Um, it's more, again, of a sort of uh, experimental building. So we've got different um, things that we're trialing on it. We've got a solar collector on the roof, which feeds into our inter-seasonal heat store demonstrator. We've got the transpired solar collector on the wall, which is feeding into a diurnal storage. So, and we've also got then a test rig of different sort of solar thermal and PV systems linked back to batteries um, and other things. So it's very experimental, um, but we've mainly focused on new build, um, primarily because we don't want, we feel like although retrofit is a massive um, issue for the UK, we don't want people to continue to build buildings that will then need retrofitting. Um, and we're a fairly, fairly small group, so we feel it's kind of easier to tackle new build at the moment. But we certainly do want to get into retrofit projects um, as we move forward. Okay, um, so then we've got um, asking if you can discuss how you think that this tool will be relevant to building engineers. Um, well, I think in the same way that it would to architectural designers, because um, what we want from active buildings, and there's more about this in my design guide, is the collaboration between people. So I think often or historically in buildings, um, you've had the architectural design and then the building engineers and the contractors have come in later in a project. And actually, I think that needs to change. Um, certainly for these sorts of buildings, you need the engineers involved right at the start. Um, so I think what, what I would like to think is that the tool, I mean, whether you're engineer or architect, you're going to use the RIBA plan of work stages in a project. So I'm hoping that it would be relevant to all designers. Um, and I see engineers as being, you know, just as critical as anyone else in the process more so really as we're trying to look at um, systems that work well together. Brilliant. Um, so we've actually we've got a lot of people asking if they can have copies of the slides is that something that we can arrange? Yeah that's fine yeah that, that'll be fine because you're, you're recording this as well aren't you but um, yes yeah. you can send us the slides. Okay, brilliant. So we've got um, people are sending in their questions very rapidly now. Um, <laughs> have you considered the utilisation of the office building and how do occupancy numbers and the flow of people affect energy performance? Does it differ seasonally? Mm. Yeah, so I mean, we definitely considered the utilisation of it. Um, so we and occupancy numbers, flow of people, all of that definitely does affect energy performance. Um, I showed on one of the slides where we've got the um, environmental monitors of all the rooms, they also monitor occupancy. Um, and we've got some interesting projects underway with um, Cisco and some others, which are looking at um, addressable, light, uh, addressable lighting and addressable sensors in buildings that can um, show exactly where people are in a building and look at um, how that's affecting, you know, the thermal performance, um, all those sorts of things. The projects, the projects are ongoing, I would say at the moment, because it's still um, fairly new and we're still um, trialing different things. Um, annoyingly, we've not been in the office obviously for a while now, so it's had a few months without any occupancy, but we were, progressing quite nicely with those projects before um, the pandemic um, and it does differ seasonally so we'd um, designed the system to um, with the MVHR unit so we can capture and um, use the heat very efficiently heat that's generated in the building we can um, recirculate um, and we, we found some issues things like um, we'd uh, for example, extended our um, heating system into the control room because we noticed the temperatures were quite hot in that and we don't have air conditioning. And then we were using that heat in the heating system. But of course, in the summer, you don't want that heat. So that caused an another issue then with our control room and we had to find an alternative solution to that. So we're learning all the time and trialing new things. Um, so yeah, it's constant um, evaluation and feeding the learning back into the 
um, into the research really. Brilliant. Okay, so um, as I've said, people seem to be very rapidly sending questions in, so I'm trying to keep an eye on them. But I think what we might do is um, I'll pull a report of all of the questions that have been asked, along with yeah. any others that I get sent, and I'll send them over to you. Um, yeah. That just because that might be a little bit easier than continuously putting you on the spot a little bit during this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So if anyone does still have any other questions, you can still send them through or email them over to me and um, me and Joanna will put together a little questions and answer um, email for you and I'll send them over to everyone that has attended today. Um, if that is OK with you, Joanna? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we've done that on previous webinars, actually, as well, and it's I think it works quite well. Um, yeah. Because you know you don't remember everything from a presentation anyway so it's always quite useful to have it written down yeah no that's fine so that i'll do that then um so yeah i will pull the report and i'll email the questions over to joanna as mentioned if anyone has any other questions please do send them through um so i just want to thank joanna for providing that presentation for us all this morning um, and for everyone who has joined us as well, thank you very much. Um, it will be uploaded to YouTube um, later on today, so it will be available then as well. Um, and you guys will all receive the link from the system if you want to share it with anyone. Our next webinar is on Wednesday, the 2nd of September with Paul Colbeck of GeoShield Limited. Um, it's looking at an introduction to ground gas and construction procedure. Um, I did mention in the webinar yesterday if you joined us. If not, um, hopefully you'll have seen by now that CAPE has um, restructured the certificate and building control course that we offer. And we have some new fire safety practitioner certificate course as well. Um, all of the information is on our website, so please do go and have a look. Um, if you have any topic ideas for webinars, um, or if you can provide one yourself, or you know anyone who can, please do let me know. We are keen to work with as many of you as possible. Um, so with that, I will wrap up. Thank you again for everyone who joined us today, and thank you again to Joanna for providing the session for us. I will get the questions and answers over to you as soon as possible, um, but any feedback or comments, please do let me know.